GMX is a decentralized perpetual exchange with a strong supportive community and an impressive user base. We discuss the basics of perpetual trading, the development process in DeFi, community building, and so much more. Here's our conversation. Started with recording. Nice. All right. Hi, Jonesy. Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, hey, Ashley, uh, and hi uh, to the entire Metis ecosystem and community. It's, uh, it's great to be joining you guys today. Yeah, it's, I'm really excited. Um, I, I learned about DMX from a friend of mine when I first started working with, with Metis almost a year ago. And um, I, I've been interested ever since. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled to get to have you on the call today. Uh, that sounds good. I uh, actually started with GMX, um, started working or contributing to GMX about um, three quarters of a year ago. So I haven't been with the uh, group of contributors that long and um, started following them, uh, yeah, probably about a year and a month or two uh, ago. So uh, it, a lot has happened in, in that time. And it's been it's been a busy and eventful year, you might say. Absolutely. I when I started a year ago, um, I knew very little about this entire world of Web three, and to um, to reflect on how the industry has changed over the past year, and also just all that I've learned, it's it's been a wild ride, but a, a really fun one. <laughs> so, how did you uh, get into this uh, sector? Did you do similar work in uh, in a let's say traditional company? <laughs> no, um, I was a teacher, so I'm. I've been in education for most of my life, and um, oh, wow. I found Crypto Chicks. That one of the founders of Metis has a nonprofit called Crypto Chicks, which educates people on on blockchain and and startups. Yeah, I've heard about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I found a link for um, an education manager on LinkedIn, and I I <laughs> met with them and spoke with Elena, and she was like, you know, I think we have a role for you at at Metis, and so she hired me on as the education manager, and um, I've been learning, uh, drinking, uh, from a fire hydrant ever since trying to I can figure imagine, everything yeah, out. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's, that's really cool that you actually come from an educational background. I've done a little bit of education work, but it's, it's, it's really been not more than a, than a handful of weeks in my entire career, but I have, uh, quite some, uh, some educators in my, uh, in my family and background. And I think, I have my own, I've had my own boutique communications company for the last 12 years or so, although I've only been doing that in a, in a crypto um, sense for the last, well, less than a year. But a lot of good communication work is, in a sense, education work. And uh, I, uh, I have an affinity with the sector, that's for sure. Nice. So, so that's kind of how you moved into GMX. You were always, you had your own communications firm and then decided to start working in Web3. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'd been been following the uh, a couple of the core contributors for um, I think probably the last two years, when when GMX didn't exist yet, and uh, when we were still talking, still talking about Gambit on uh, on Binance Smart Chain, and uh, some of the other uh, preceding protocols which the core contributors worked on. Um, but but it gave me a, a really good feeling, and I, I really liked the ethos that um, the contributors showed, and I had the feeling that. In the long run, this was a project that had a lot of potential. They had the right mentality of just build and don't worry about the noise and, and deliver and um, build out a, an ecosystem of supporting partners of a community that that's uh, that's involved and that are your best ambassadors. And um, from the start, that that felt like an approach that resonated with me. And I uh, had been following the progress of GMX for the first few months after the launch and. I had the feeling that they were doing a whole lot really well, but at the same time, you could tell that it was a small team and that things were growing exponentially fast. So you you run into certain limits. You know, if you only have that many people, that many contributors to uh, take care of everything, then inevitably certain responsibilities uh, get the short end of the stick. So I saw some opportunities in in the communication uh, field, and I uh, I. Bet basically wrote an analysis of uh, of how I, as an outsider, saw um, GMX um, doing their communication work up to that point and where I saw some opportunities that uh, would be worth grasping. And that's uh, that was well received. And that's how it started, how I uh, rolled into the group of contributors, you might say. That's awesome. That's an excellent way to, uh, to get involved, to demonstrate that you've already kind of 
got a stake in a, and an interest in a project and you yeah, see a need exactly. and you point out exactly how you could fill it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that that's a great way uh, to go about it. I mean, I think the beautiful part about working in this ecosystem is that there are a tremendous amount of opportunities just like that. There is so much being developed and so much being done and so much that still needs to be done that if you're capable, if you are if you have skills that can be applied, you can follow any project you like, uh, look around, scout around and figure out what is your sub-segment of this entire uh, strange crypto industry and then get involved, you know, just, just get involved, get in touch with teams, with groups of contributors, try to understand the protocol and, and make it clear how you might be able to add value. I mean, there are an immense amount of interesting jobs and positions that can be filled in crypto. And I, I highly encourage anybody who is passionate about the industry who, who finds himself almost addicted to the industry because i think we've all uh, noticed that it does have that tendency in a way the sort of manic uh, drive to that, that drags you in and keeps you involved i certainly have experienced it that way and if you feel that um, and if it takes up a lot of your time and you have that energy and passion for it then get involved with a project you like Absolutely. I also love the way you talked about um, how GMX seemed to be a project that was just focusing on building, um, that they were just providing value and, and their, the community kind of grew organically from seeing that there was some real et work mm -hmm. ethic kind of behind the project. And I've been reflecting a lot in recent weeks about how we've kind of flipped the script in crypto where we kind of incentivize community members first and then worry about the value later. And it's really built this unsustainable <laughs> um, roller coaster that we're on. And so kind of working in the opposite direction and focusing on value first is um, something I'm really excited to see more projects start to focus on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so tell us a little bit more about GMX. So you handle communications. Um, for people who don't know, what is GMX and uh, and how did it all get started? So GMX is a decentralized perpetual exchange. Um, to be even more complete, a decentralized exchange for uh, perpetual trading as well as swaps, because we offer uh, swaps as well. Uh, started on uh, Arbitrum a year and about a quarter ago. Uh, and expanded to Avalanche a couple of months after. Those are the two blockchains that we are deployed on. Um, before GMX, there were uh, other projects uh, like Gambit, where some of the core functionality that ended up being a part of GMX was developed. So the, the group of contributors also really grew organically. Um, in a sense, GMX, and it's a big community um, that we have now is a, a sort of merger of two prior communities uh, which existed and which uh, got together. And some of the foundational ideas behind those projects were combined to form the trading system that is now GMX. And um, many of those core contributors are still involved and and, and deeply uh, passionate and, and right now hands down uh, working their uh, their asses off, I might say, in developing GMX uh, V2, which is around the corner and which will uh, be quite an uh, an important update to our uh, trading system with a new system of liquidity provision and many more assets to trade. Well, let's uh, let's not directly get into uh, all those details because that's a bit more uh, future oriented. But that's um, that's basically how it started. Yeah, and it's, um, it's been a, a wild year. Uh, immense amount of uh, things happening over the course of just this uh, this last year of being deployed on Arbitrum. And when we deployed on Arbitrum, there really wasn't a meaningful Arbitrum blockchain. Arbitrum was still uh, an idea on paper. Rollups were really uh, largely still an idea on paper. Uh, same with Optimism and Metis and uh, <clears throat> and it. Uh, it was it was in, in a sense a bet on on the long term viability of the vision and the arbitrum ecosystem. So we launched together with them, and um, the ball has been uh, rolling ever since, snowballing, I might say, because 
we're about to um let me actually double check it may be the case that we already just passed that milestone i'm just now uh, taking a quick look at our gmx.io website no our total trading volume funny enough now stands at 99 billion dot 980 million so within the coming so couple of hours we're going to cross that uh, that magnificent and mind-boggling threshold of 100 billion in trading volume which is remarkable for a dex and is something that uh a year ago, probably even half a year ago, I wouldn't have thought was possible for the centralized exchange. So that shows you how much uh, the the sector has developed in, in just the last year. That's really incredible. Um, the sheer volume is it's it's hard to wrap your mind around that. that absolutely, amount. absolutely. Well, let's um let's kind of dive in a little deeper into uh, some of the basics of perpetuals trading. Can you talk to us a mm -hmm. little bit about what a perpetual is and maybe even dif differentiate that from futures for anyone listening? Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, good basis to start at. Uh, perpetuals are um, in a sense uh, a form of future contracts, but then without an expiration date. That's uh, why they got the title perpetuals. They uh, don't roll over. They just have uh, uh, an uh, they have no end date so you can basically uh, execute your option whenever you want and there's no set time limit that you have to deal with so you can go long or short on an asset and um, sell uh, or buy at whatever price level you're comfortable with so in that sense they're uh, a more simple version of uh, options and futures and um, that's probably why perpetuals became so popular in crypto uh, pioneered by uh, by Bitmax, um, which most of you will probably be, be familiar with, where they uh, took off tremendously, and and since then, a number of other exchanges adopted the idea of perpetual futures, and it seemed inevitable that at some point a decentralized exchange would uh, would start taking over market share from those uh, centralized exchanges, and that's uh, that's been the GMX vision from the get go. How do we offer the optimal decentralized trading experience to traders. Amazing. I, um, I'll confess that I didn't really know much. I've never really been into to trading until, uh, well, until I started working in crypto and learning about it. Um, so I'd not even really heard about perpetuals um, until I learned about GMX. We talk a little bit about because perpetual contracts don't have the expiration date. What does it look like to close mm -hmm. a perpetual contract um, since there is no ex expiry? Do, uh, do you it sell is... it? Do you what do you do? Yeah, it starts by um, taking your position. So you 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 go either long or short, and um, borrow funds from the uh, liquidity providers to do so. Uh, on GMX, liquidity provision is in the hands of GLP, which is uh, our liquidity token, and basically represents uh, a multi-asset pool that consists largely of BTC and ETH and the number of stable coins. And that pool facilitates all the trading that takes place on GMX. So if you were to uh, to long at a certain price level, you would borrow funds from the GLP pool to do so. Uh, and you know, after uh, an hour, a day, a week, whatever your preferred time frame is, you might decide that you uh, are in profit enough and you want to close your position and then you return the borrowed funds to the GLP pool and you walk away with the profits you made. In a nutshell, that's uh, how the system works. Sweet. Can you explain the the leverage margin there? Like what what's the safe um a safe relatively <laughs> safe what's the the <laughs> margin that people have to kind of monitor there um so that they avoid liquidation is there like a threshold that gmx encourages or um is there a, a limit uh we do encourage people to um, to be responsible when it comes to leverage it's uh it's really not something that you should take lightly um in, i think whenever it comes to borrowing funds 
from others, whether it's for investing or for trading, you should be uh, well aware of what you're doing. Some people um, borrow to hedge their portfolios. Some people uh, leverage trade because they're uh, slightly addicted to the, the gambling uh, aspect uh, or, or the feeling that it provides in terms of uh, adrenaline. Um, what is responsible and what is risk is, is a complicated question in that um, context, I think. But I would highly recommend anybody to uh, to be responsible when it comes to trading and especially leverage trading. Now, when it comes to um, providing collateral, um, GMX allows you to open a position of, of any size. It can accommodate small traders. It can accommodate uh, whales that uh, use positions of, of many millions up to uh, 50 or 100 million. Uh, our liquidity pool um, by now has become so big that we can accommodate uh, traders of that size as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah. And um, yeah, when it comes to um, making the decision as to what is responsible leverage, uh, we used to allow uh, up to 30x leverage. And that was um, up to uh, 50x about a month or two ago which was the result of, uh, of a DAO governance decision from, um, I think, uh, about six months ago. It took a little bit of time to implement because uh, the focus was so much on developing our new uh, GMX V2 system. So uh, 50X leverage is now currently the max, and that is quite a, a remarkable uh, lever, level of leverage to, uh, to trade with. So um, generally speaking, we encourage everybody to be uh, conservative of leverage and to be uh, sensible when it comes to taking leverage positions. It's not in our advantage to see people get liquidated. Uh, that's not what we're after. In the end, we want to offer a, a decent trading experience for traders as well as hedgers, uh, people who want to, uh, to balance their exposure. And um, GMX is also not reliant on liquidations to be profitable. We rather see people uh, be profitable traders over the long run than see uh, people go bust and uh, and get uh, frustrated and never come back. Of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. So apart from, you know, keeping responsible leverage in mind um, and the, the volatility of, you know, the underlying asset that people are, are you know, putting up for collateral, what would you say are uh, the other biggest risks that people would need to keep in mind if they wanted to get into perps trading? I think um, the volatility is is an important point. Um, when it comes to perps trading, you, um, yeah, by levering up, you're, you're increasing your um, risk to such an extent that it, you have to constantly monitor your positions. Um, and I think crypto already has a tendency to uh, keep people constantly staring at the charts and uh, following the markets because everything feels so volatile. Things can go up 10, 20% in a day easily and then uh, down 30% the next day. Once you've been through a couple of, uh, of big crashes, you maybe get a little bit more immune to those um, bizarre fluctuations. But the reality is that uh, there's an incredible amount of volatility in crypto. And um, that means you have to be extra responsible when it comes to uh, trading and using leverage wisely. So that's what I would uh, would emphasize to, uh, to be well aware of uh, the tokens you're trading, what liquidity in the market is what your collateral is and whether you're uh, how much you're able to lose without it affecting you uh, how much collateral you have to top up if it turns out to be necessary um, you know approach it responsibly and then uh, these are great tools for a trader to work with thank you yeah i mean <laughs> to say crypto is volatile almost seems like an understatement these days and if you've been in for any amount Same. of time and, <laughs> and kind of survived some of the craziness of, of 2022, then uh, I think 
you had some trial by fire. And I have heard more than once that uh, getting rugged or uh, making poor decisions is almost a rite of passage. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's nice to it hear that uh, GMX is trying not to provide that for people. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly right. I think um, it can take a psychological toll on you uh, to some extent. A market that trades 24-7 that doesn't give you uh, weekends to relax. That doesn't give you uh, a proper night's sleep because you uh, you wake up uh, in, in a bad dream, uh, worried about your portfolio, and have to quickly check the charts. Uh, that's the reality of the the industry that we work in. I think uh, to a certain extent, and you have to be uh, careful with what that does uh, psychologically. You know, it, it, I think we live nowadays in, generally speaking, in in a sort of a digital world that is constantly um, eager for your attention and, and trying to catch your eye. And uh, crypto has those same characteristics. It, it has a tendency to want to um, get your attention and want to absorb your time. And there's uh, it's important to, uh, to be aware of that, I think, and to, uh, to safeguard against that getting out of hand. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like... Um... There's a lot of bright and shiny in, in crypto and even in in working in the industry and kind of seeing the ebb and flow of the market and just, you know, big names rise and fall. It's still still mm. really easy to kind of get wrapped up in it. But uh, if I find myself not being able to put my phone down or um, staying up at night thinking about what's going on with my assets, then I know that I'm <laughs> exactly. in a little too deep and I need to go yeah. um, touch grass, no, as that, I say, put my feet up. That's very ground. true. That's very true. Yeah. I mean, uh, safeguard your your mental health as well. I mean, I, I, I get both sides of the equation because if it's your passion, uh, you're constantly involved in it. But the reality of it is that uh, you have to balance uh, the time and the energy out with other uh, important things in your life. And I think that goes for anybody regardless of uh, what side of the world or what country you uh, live you know you have to uh, you have to be careful with uh, allowing it to swallow up everything else indeed do uh, do you have any idea what share of uh, trading activity uh, perps take in in DeFi in general because um, it see I mean, maybe for people who have who have been interested in finance and trading for a long time, it's it doesn't seem novel, but I don't hear that many people discussing it. And I feel like I have had many DeFi conversations this year. Um, do you do you know how how big it is in the larger share of trading? Well, I think it would be surprising to many, but um perpetuals uh, tend to have an even larger market share than than um regular trading there's a uh, in terms of market size um, and this of course is of course amplified by the fact that you're trading on leverage but generally um perpetual swaps is is growing in dominance and is uh is significantly higher than uh, traditional trading normal spot yeah. trading I mean, with that. yeah and do you think that's because you're not actually like <clears throat> purchasing and holding the asset um it's just the leverage piece that you mentioned yeah i've been wondering um about that myself because in in many ways i believe that crypto is by nature uh, sort of levered up already because of the volatility and because of the um the virtual character of the of many of the assets that you're trading um, it feels like you're already on leverage just by spot trading crypto in a sense so for most people i think trading spot is quite uh, a sensible choice and why perpetual trading has taken off to that extent um i'm not really sure i suppose a part of it is institutional adoption and, and bigger players who use perpetuals to hedge their portfolios or, you know, high frequency traders, um, th that, that size of the market has, of course, grown tremendously. And I'm sure that they are focused on, uh, on, on perpetuals and options, um, future trading of, of many uh, varieties. 
but why that discrepancy is so um, big, I yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss to say. I think. Yeah, I feel like um, <clears throat> I really have underplayed in my own mind and understanding just the the value of the the game feel um, that comes with trading. And obviously, it's uh, it's quite different than you know you're playing for an NFT or something in a game, but mm. it just the, the idea of, of risk and um, just kind of tracking everything. Even if I do like paper trading, just because I'm just learning, you know, um, mm -hmm. the excitement is, is noticeably addictive. And so I can see how, um, how people could, could get really excited about spot trading, but then let's see, Oh, well I can do so much more. And this is, has like another layer to it. That's true. That's true. I think a, a good part of it is probably that seduction that it has that you you see spot assets go up uh, 10, 20 percent and you see some of these PL screenshot of uh, of a perpetual trade on that same asset at uh, 20x or 40x leverage and somebody is, is making tons of money in just the 24 hour time frame. Um, you see examples of those uh, everywhere and you know that stuff gets around on twitter and on on reddit and other popular crypto forums and i think part of it is that aspect of the grass is always greener on the other side you know you see your own portfolio uh, going down you think you're losing out you have to uh, fomo into what other more successful people are doing so you also have to start dabbling in uh, perpetuals and higher leverage etc cetera, etc cetera. i i think that that seduction is is sort of present in our market and I don't think that's necessarily healthy. I think uh, <laughs> in general, you're you're better off uh, letting uh, people specialize in in what they're good at, but but be focused on where your edge lies. And that may well be uh, very occasional spot trades or even long term investing. Uh, you know, on the uh, on the monthly time frames. Um, it's it's not by nature um, the case that you uh, end up with better results when you get more involved and start uh, trading more and at higher leverage, et cetera. And at, at some point, I guess many of us go through a phase also where we experiment with that and, and we blow up an account and we uh, come to the realization that that doesn't offer salvation either. And in the end, we find a balance where we, we get a better feel for what really suits us and it can often be a, a more simpler forum where you just uh, invest for the long term and, and maybe use a perpetuals platform like GMX to uh, occasionally hedge your portfolio when you expect downside in the market. You know, everybody has to, to find a, a healthy spot for themselves, uh, I think, in that regard. Definitely. I've just got some mm -hmm. uh, like basic advice from from someone when I was I was reading about trading in general and they were like, if you don't understand the strategy, then don't do it. And so no, um, that's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of people um, kind of dive in and, you know, if, uh, if it's a small amount, you're just kind of learning things. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, I've just seen too many friends crying this year. <laughs> so yeah, yeah um, no, I, I know what you mean, and 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 we've seen too many examples also of uh, of huge centralized players blowing up by by over promising, you know, by by promising uh, amazing APRs that they could only realize by uh, by you know lending out customer funds to other uh, big parties who would then uh, somehow come up with those yields that in the end turn out to be unsustainable and, and have the entire uh, pyramid come crumbling down. Now, it, it is really wise to be aware of that, that even in an industry that is so much about the next uh, best shiny thing as crypto can be, um, be aware of that, that, you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side and, um, you know, uh, play it calm, and in the long run, you'll uh, be better off for it, probably. That's the hope. Um, do you what What are some things that you see coming down the line for perpetuals trading, um, specifically with GMX? But um, if there are any developments that 
that you see industry wide that you're excited about or that you think we need? Uh, I'd love to hear about those. Mm, in in general, I'm um, I'm very positive about the decentralized exchange space in general. I think if you look at the last couple of years you see a very clear trend that DEXs are taking over some market share from centralized exchanges. Um, some of the events of the last year only accelerate that trend, which was already underway. Um, and it, it, it's growing. Um, I think that is a good sign for perpetual exchanges like GMX. I think it's a good sign for decentralized exchanges in general. I expect that entire sector to be uh, bullish for uh, for a better for lack of a better word in in the coming uh, five to ten years, and to grow at at a sizable annual rate. So that's um, that's the underlying trend that I think will help this entire uh, deck space keep growing and expanding and offer enough room for various perpetual uh, platforms to do well to find product market fit to attract traders and liquidity providers in a, in a healthy way and balance those stakeholders to end up with with a successful protocol so i'm i'm optimistic about the entire space i think we have a good growth prospect and as for uh, gmx in particular i think um we have some incredible developers who have been uh, working really hard on further iterating, um, further uh, evolving the current system with, that we have, which has proven to be quite successful over the last year, uh, using uh, the GOP system for liquidity provision. and um, But it comes with a few downsides, and those have become uh, more apparent to us and we've been trying to come up with solutions to those challenges and that's what's been in the works for the last six months plus and i think we're about to see the end result of that we've gone through a number of audits the the final audit is currently underway uh, should be finished within say two to three weeks and after that um, we'll be able to uh, to announce and, and launch uh, a GMX version 2 that I think is a significant improvement over what we've already uh, quite successfully established. So that's something I'm, I'm absolutely looking forward to. And we're working with a couple of uh, interesting partners in the uh, community to, uh, to develop new things which will tie into that and which we'll announce uh, around the same time. But I'm, unfortunately, I can't really... Um, uh, lift the lid on those uh, uh, secrets just yet, but uh, yeah, we have a couple of uh, of amazing things coming up, and I uh, uh, I really look forward to what the coming months are going to bring. And th and it's not just for GMX alone. I think, as I said, I think the segment is large enough that there will be other per platforms that do well, and I look forward to seeing what they come up with as well. There's there's a certain cross fertilization in this business where um, we see the solutions to the dilemmas that they come up with and that can inspire us. They see what we've come up with and what works and adopt that and further iterate on that and try to improve that. I think that's, that's very healthy, that, that sort of friendly competition where you uh, challenge each other, inspire each other to do better and occasionally, uh, you know, shit post about each other and, uh, and joke <laughs> about each other as well. So I, uh, I, I'm, yeah, I think it's a healthy space and I think we have, uh, we have some beautiful years ahead of us. I agree. Um, I, I love the, the idea that open source is kind of the, the bedrock of, of web three and that there's room for collaboration and that, uh, you know, if, if one person wins, we all win and you mm -hmm. don't see that in a lot of other industries and it really speaks to, um, just the spirit of of the development and i i really appreciate it and feel feel lucky to be a part of it definitely um, there, there's tremendous power in, in being such a fertile breeding ground for innovation and for um for coming up with impressive visions and very quickly being able to uh, bring those to market and experiment with how they work and then further improve it's it's yeah it really stimulates innovation in, in a unique way i think definitely you, you mentioned um, 
you know, projects, finding product market fit and kind of updating to GMX V2 so that you're kind of working out some problems. I'd love to hear more about how you engage with your community to kind of understand the problems that they were facing so that you could continually refine. Um, and I don't know how much, you know, on the communication side, that was your role, but anything that you could speak to in terms of being responsive to community and um, just actually talking to users to develop uh, in a more effective way, that would that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, that's a, that's a very valid question because I believe that that for a business in general, that dialogue with your your customers and users is very important, and in crypto, perhaps even more so, it it it's very important to be uh, in a constant dialogue with your users to get good feedback. Now, one of the dilemmas that we uh, ran into is that, for example, the the GMX.io um, web app does not track its users. It has no way of knowing where its users come from, what they're doing, what other platforms they use. Um, because of privacy reasons, you don't, we don't track, we don't follow any of that. So we have limited information about our users. Um, whereas in a, in, a, in a traditional business setting, you would be able to uh, build up an elaborate data set with a lot of uh, valuable information about your customers and their click patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So we've had to go about that in, in very different ways. We had to uh, keep the community engaged from early on, which we, um, which we mainly did by having dedicated community ambassadors, people um, staffing our telegrams and discords who were passionate about it, who were uh, educational about it, who, you know, when people approach them with support questions, who do their best to help and point people in the right direction, do their best to keep people involved. I believe as a user, you know, you're bound to run into issues because uh, many crypto protocols uh, um, have tiny bugs or are have tiny dependencies where you occasionally run into something that isn't working as uh, you expected it. And those are the points where you need to find proper support somewhere. Now, if you can develop that support system, and, and especially if it can come in the form of actual personal contact where somebody uh, listens to you, receives your feedback, and offers you a good solution, that's the ideal scenario. So we uh, we emphasized that. We had great community managers and ambassadors and made sure we were reachable and accessible friendly on all those channels that are popular in the crypto industry. Um, and from that point on, we built that out. Those people who were your er early users and who um, saw that you have a welcoming and knowledgeable community turn into your ambassadors. They spread the word to others and that's how the flywheel keeps rolling. And it was the same with our traders. We uh, try to get feedback from our traders, which like I said, isn't particularly easy because you don't have a direct way of contacting them through your web app. We've occasionally organized uh, surveys to try to get information about crucial aspects that we wanted to know a bit more about. We um, uh, important bigger recurring traders we try to stay in contact with, we try to organize groups with so that we can ask them for feedback about the trading experience, what did they think were the strong points, what should be improved, and then we can further iterate based on that feedback that we get. So that's a constant process of keeping people engaged, keeping a community vibe going, which you know goes as far as just stimulating people to build things on GMX to develop functionality alongside GMX, whether, it, for example, the, I think the GMX Blueberry Club is an incredible example, which was just early uh, supporters and contributors getting together and thinking, okay, listen, this community has a really healthy feel. Let's celebrate that in some fun way with, you know, a silly Blueberry NFT uh, profile pictures, which uh, can then start to represent us. And that further reinforces that feel of uh, community and community building. And all of that ties together to make your user base sticky, to make your community stand out and receptive to others. And I think that that has been one of our strongest suits probably. 
Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about the blueberries. I'd, I'd been introduced to them before, um, but I didn't really know the origin story. So thank you for sharing that. I think, um, mm -hmm. yeah, in, in a space where privacy is uh, s such a, an integral part of the industry, mm. it can be really challenging to make data-driven decisions. And so it really exactly. does require this kind of grassroots effort and staying engaged one-on-one -on -one with your community and talking to them and um, being available. And it's a huge red flag for me if a, if a project doesn't have someone who's um, pretty readily available to answer questions and provide support <clears throat> right. or even just say, hey, I know that's a problem. We're working on it. Thank you so much for being a part of our community mm. and bringing it to our yep. attention. You know, you don't have to have all the answers, but you, you need to say that you don't have all the answers. <laughs> Um, no, absolutely, absolutely, and I think uh, particularly in in this virtualizing world where everything becomes ever more digital, and um, we can expect you know uh, uh, Chat GPT to be uh, offering us uh, support uh, for a lot of businesses in the coming years. It really helps if you actually have a person there who treats you as a human being with a challenge, and that you have personal contact and personal assistance and a sense of an actual community of people working together, striving for the same goals and having fun in the process. That's invaluable. Absolutely. And especially in a space where, um, you know, you, you don't know the team members, you can't see them. So being able to, no. to trust that mm -hmm. you're going to be received, um, in a friendly way and, and offered feedback, um, is, is really important. I know that uh, Uniswap a few months ago announced that they were changing their privacy policy so they could gather more data to make more data-driven decisions about their user right, experience. Right. And it caused a little bit of a stir. So um, yeah, I, I like the idea of either making it an option for people to share that with you if, if they mm -hmm. want to offer information or just doing the work of rolling up your sleeves and, and talking to people. Yeah, no, that's right. It's 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 extremely important, but it's time consuming and it's uh, it's not always easy, but it's definitely worthwhile. Well, um, so we we also kind of touched on it's on open source for a minute and seeing that GMX is open source. Uh, what are your thoughts on forks of GMX and and uh, kind of expanding that contribution to to the industry in that way? Yeah, I think, I mean, the open source ethos is, is a beautiful thing. And I think uh, GMX is a, a great example of um, both the light and the dark side of that uh, open source mentality. I mean, we, we've seen so many forks uh, of GMX pop up in, in just the last year that I think that you can imagine uh, any blockchain you want. And there's probably a GMX fork that was launched on that at some point. Uh, at a certain point, it seemed like every week there was a new uh, GMX fork being launched somewhere. So uh, we really uh, kind of lost track almost. And uh, is that a negative thing? Not necessarily. I mean, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. If you build something that works well, then uh, you know it, other people are free to copy your code and to uh, iterate on that and to try to make it even better. Uh, as I said, there, there's part of that process is really productive and healthy and uh, allows you to inspire um, others um, as long as you're more than just copycats now i don't think that any of our forks have um, found truly meaningful traction or, or, or done really well um, so in that sense we're not worried about forks it doesn't really uh, bother us and it doesn't uh, take up significant mind space for uh, contributors of gmx the other side of the open source equation is much more interesting it's the composability it's uh, the dozens of projects that are now building on gmx whether it's our trading system or whether it's building vaults on our liquidity pools uh, GLP uh, Delta neutral solutions have been a theme for the last months with many contributor projects stepping up, trying to come up with ways to make GLP Delta neutral, make it even more attractive for investors. And we're working with you know a wide range of uh, teams in the ecosystem to to build out these these interesting solutions that that build on the GMX uh, Lego blocks. 
and that's that's wonderful i mean that's the type of ecosystem we're trying to generate it's not only about uh, gmx as is it's also about the project around us that that build on the foundations that we've laid and that deliver even more uh, interesting services to crypto users based on that so that that positive side um, of the open source uh, mentality has been amazing to witness because it's it's grown so fast we have new teams of builders approach us every couple of days with a new vision for what might be able to be built with a certain gmx lego blocks and we have interesting discussions that come about because of that which you know give us certain insights and inspire us to uh, to look into new directions so it's it's a very fertile breeding ground for uh, for innovation as we uh, as we just said absolutely and yeah i think the the point you made about not just being a copycat but you know the the purpose of the open source is that you're you're adding on you're building you're improving yeah. upon mm. something so that that needs to be done in order uh, for us for it to be really worth its uh, worth the time worthwhile. So, yeah, they they go hand in hand in a way. If you want to allow the the latter to take place, then you have to also uh, yeah you create the space for for copycats to just fork your code and and try to make a buck off of that, which is the way it is. I mean that's that's fine too. Well. <laughs> I'm really grateful to to have had this conversation and and to to learn so much more about GMX. Is there anything else coming up or any other words from GMX that you want to share before we we round out our call for today? Um, well, well no, let me just repeat uh, a few things. Uh, for one, gratitude, gratitude at uh, the amazing things that have happened in the last year and and appreciation to everybody in the blueberry ecosystem that we've been able to work with. Um, gratitude to you for hosting us because uh, I, I really enjoy conversations like this and uh, it, it's great to also be in touch with uh, with a roll-up like Metis where we haven't uh, we don't have a presence yet and we haven't uh, really discussed much with but it's lovely to see um, that branching out and to have contacts in all these uh, different layers of the crypto ecosystem um, for the rest for GMX, like I said, we have some amazing announcements coming up in uh, in between well four to eight weeks, roughly, uh, which I think uh, will be really interesting when our uh, version two launches and the innovation that that makes possible. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's worth uh, keeping an eye on that. So uh, feel free to follow us on uh, on Telegram, connect with the Blueberry community on Discord. Find us somewhere and uh, keep an eye on us because we have some amazing things in store for you. Thank you so much. I'll be sure to share links in our in our show notes to the different GMX spots that people could connect. Um, yeah, cool. And, that would be very welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm really grateful to uh, to have joined the space and to have the opportunity to talk with people like you and to learn. And um, I just uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to share with us in our community today. Um, teaching people about what we're doing is kind of my top priority every day at work. So I love these conversations because they, they make my job easier. So thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Same. No, appreciate it's really it. good to hear that. Uh, keep educating, Ashley. I mean, uh, yeah, I love that mentality. So keep up the good work. Thank you. You too. All right, fam. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Weekly Wisdom. Be sure to check out our show notes to learn more about our partners from today's show. There you'll also find links to resources to connect with the Metis team, learn more about our permissionless platform, and connect with us on future podcast content. We would also love for you to take a moment to rate and review this podcast to support our mission of bringing blockchain to the people. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.